You know, it's not lost on me that we are having a hearing today surrounding fossil fuel misinformation and disinformation campaigns on the same day that we are scheduled to vote on legislation that has been deeply influenced by the lobbying efforts of the fossil fuel industry. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity for us to be speaking with the CEOs of BP, Chevron, Exxon, Shell, and the American Petroleum Institute. Um, speaking of which, Mr. Somers, as the president of the American Petroleum Institute, Part of your job is to help lobby and advocate and champion the fossil fuel industry. And that includes particularly in legislation before the United States Congress. You told CNN on television, quote, we are leaving everything on the field here in terms of our opposition to reconciliation. We are using every tool at our disposal to work against these energy proposals. And frankly, Mr. Somers, I appreciate your candor because most lobbying uh, organization heads aren't as forthright and transparent about their efforts to manipulate U.S. legislation. Um, so what does that all-out approach look like? Am I correct, Mr. Somers, that the oil and gas industry overall, including the companies that you represent and members you represent today, has spent about $55.6 million in lobbying in the, within the last 10 months this year alone. That, that figure sounds right to you, about, correct? Congresswoman, thank you for your question. But let me clarify something, first of all, about who the American Petroleum Institute is. Our mission, first of all, is that we're a standard-setting organization for the global oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. We maintain over 700 standards in the areas of health, environment, and safety. In addition to that, we advocate for the oil and Mr. gas Somers, industry. Mr. Somers, is that figure 55.6 million in lobbying funds correct or not? I have limited time. Congresswoman, I don't have those numbers at okay. my disposal. Well, according to our disclosures, that seems to be the figure, but I, I will move on. Um, I would like to turn my attention to Mr. And I apologize, we just simply don't have much time allocated here. Uh, Mr. Woods, um, as a CEO of ExxonMobil, are you familiar with an individual by the name of Keith McCoy? I am. He was uh, one of your top lobbyists, correct? He was a senior advisor in our Washington office. I see. Now, earlier this year, McCoy was recorded in a private session as saying, quote, I liken lobbying to fishing. You have to bait. You throw that bait out there just to kind of reel members of Congress in because they are a captive audience. They know that they need you and I need them. And he also alluded to having weekly calls with certain members of Congress as debates around reconciliation were being formed. Uh, are you aware of these calls? I am not aware of the calls. You are not aware of the calls. Have you participated in any calls with members of Congress throughout this process of uh, reconciliation and uh, infrastructure? I have. You have. Are political donations ever discussed during your calls with members of Congress? No, they're not. They are not. Does your compensation package increase as a result, the value of your compensation increase as a result of increased production from Exxon's refineries? No, volumes from our refineries are not part of my compensation. Is Exxon stock, is your compensation tied to Exxon's stock price? Yes, it is. It is. And so I would assume with increased value in Exxon's stock price and oil production, that would have a boost in the value of your compensation, correct? My compensation is based on a number of metrics and parameters from environmental safety and value creation, technology development. It is a portfolio of responsibilities that the compensation committee judges me on. Thank you very much. You know, I think one thing that often gets lost in these conversations is that some of us have to actually live the future that you all are setting on fire for us. By 2028, crop yields are, be, are already projected to begin to fail, with famine beginning to hit the world's most vulnerable populations. By 2038, current US drought, fire, and extreme heat trends make, will, could potentially make whole regions of the United States unlivable if we continue the trends that lobbyists are trying to, to have us pursue. And we have a tipping point 
by 2036. We do not have the privilege or the luxury of lobbyist spin. And it is incredibly important that we don't reach net zero or in, in some imaginary future, but that we actually cut through to carbon emissions reductions here in the United States and globally. I, uh, I submit back to the chair.